All right, good afternoon. Since uh, I briefed you guys on Friday, uh, the Department of Defense continues to move quickly as we work to stay ahead of, the, of need in combating COVID-19 hotspots around the country. As we've discussed before, DOD is providing four things in support of civilians, emergency sites, emergency supplies, emergency staff, and emergency science. We're providing both capability and capacity. Sites, uh, Army Corps is building hospitals and convention centers. We've deployed hospital ships, expeditionary field hospitals from the Army, Air Force, and Navy, all to provide urgent care so that local medical facilities can focus on COVID-19 patients as well as treating COVID-19 patients directly. With supplies, we've released 10 million uh, N95 masks. Ventilators are deployed or pre-positioned in hotspots, uh, and we're flying equipment back and forth across the globe. With staff, uh, the ships and field hospitals are fully staffed, but we are calling up additional units to send more doctors, nurses, and respiratory therapists into the hot zones, and General Friedrichs will talk about that a little bit today. And we're also taking advantage of DOD world-class research labs, including, including Fort Detrick and uh, AMRID, to look into the vaccinations and uh, treatments. Our immediate focus remains on supporting New York. While we hope, as Governor Cuomo expressed today, that New York has reached its apex, the DOD continues to surge assets to New York in preparation for the worst. To that end, we have opened the Javits Medical Facility to COVID-19 patients. Uh, the numbers on that, we've treated 44 patients there so, so far. Uh, the facility will have 1,700 beds by this Friday, uh, and unfortunately, we expect many of those beds will be, uh, will be in use. Um, the Comfort has uh, treated 41 patients, 31 are currently on board, 16 of which are in the ICU. The Comfort will continue to accept trauma, emergency, and urgent care patients irrespective of, uh, of their COVID status. Our current preference, uh, which could change at any time, given the circumstances on the ground and the request by the governor, uh, is to see Javits Center beds used by COVID patients before moving them to the Comfort. As we discussed on Saturday or our son Friday, uh, the reasons behind that, but we are uh, very attuned to the need of, uh, of New York City and New York State and uh, continuing to evaluate that. The DOD is staffing the Javits Center with military personnel, creating an immediate relief valve for the med brave medical personnel of New York City. An additional 775 medical personnel have already arrived in New York. 225 more will arrive tomorrow with 500 by Wednesday. That means a total of 1,500 additional military medical personnel will be surged in New York this week. 355 of them will be deployed to 11 New York City hospitals to assist in patient care. Uh, many of these uh, hospitals have beds available, uh, but they're starting to see their staff being uh, squeezed by the, uh, the intense workload that they have been under, and we're hoping to alleviate and assist them. We've delivered 5 million masks to New York City and 16 other states, 5 million more en route to Michigan, Texas, Washington, California, Virginia, New Jersey, and Louisiana. Outside of New York, the department is rapidly building capacity around the country. 40,000 service members are deployed to support COVID-19 operations, including nearly 4,000 medical personnel. Additionally, we have 15,000 Army Corps of Engineer personnel supporting the efforts. Army, is built, Army Corps is building 22 field hospitals and alternate care sites in 18 states. Uh, Seattle's field hospital is open today with 250 beds. Likewise, New Orleans field hospital is open today with 150 beds and will be under expansion to 275 in the coming days. Uh, the number of patients being treated there will slowly climb uh, as the need is realized uh, within the system, and that system is uh, tested uh, for how it interacts with the rest of the medical community in that area. Construction is underway in Dallas, Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles, and the Corps has evaluated more than 650 sites, including hotels, convention centers, and sports arenas for rapid conversion. Uh, today, we've obligated more than $165 million to medical construction, and that figure is growing every day. Key to this uh, effort is the state and local uh, effort with the National Guard. 21,000 service members uh, are running more than 100 test sites, over 25 alternate care sites, and distributing needed food, masks, and gloves. They're unloading grocery trucks and manning food banks. With regard to emergency science, DOD is investing over $600 million to start, as well as more than 1,000 uh, scientific and technical personnel at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research and the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. At Fort Detrick, U.S. military researchers are at the forefront of vaccine and therapeutic development, uh, and U.S. AMRID expects to begin non-human primate vaccine testing today. 
this weekend, the Secretary of Defense mandated that all personnel, including military, civilian, and family members on military installations be required to wear masks when interacting less than six feet away from each other. Uh, the services will be putting out further guidance on wearing masks and uniform in the coming days. Uh, and on Friday, the Secretary also signed a memo allowing service secretaries to pause basic training for two weeks. I believe you guys received an update from the Army Training um, Command uh, earlier today. Uh, and we will have uh, additional updates from the Navy uh, and Air Force soon. Uh, the services will continue to receive new recruits. Uh, Dr. Friedrichs is here with me today uh, to talk more about what the force is doing medically to surge doctors and nurses to the most vulnerable cities. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Friedrichs if you have any introductory remarks. Uh, thank you very much. I just I want to say uh, thank you first to the reservists who have volunteered, stepped forward when we asked for volunteers. And on very short notice, we're mobilized. In fact, many of them are moving to New York as we speak. Uh, these are folks who identified that they could leave their communities and uh, support the broader effort back in uniform. Uh, and with that, I think we'll, uh, we'll open it up for questions. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to see uh, our, is Bob or Lita on the line. Okay. All right. Tom. For the general, could you explain to us, you know, why you see so few COVID patients at Javits? Is it because the hospitals haven't reached capacity yet? It, it, I guess they're close to that. And do you expect sort of, you know, a surge of patients heading to Javits in the coming days? Yeah, so I, I think we would all be very happy if there's not a surge of patients that overwhelm the New York hospitals. But it, the people of New York need to know that if the hospitals are full, we're there and we will deliver great care to them. Uh, we're, we've been there for days now, uh, and we are standing by in case they need us. Uh, as was mentioned a moment ago, we're sending additional staff there to augment the hospitals so that they can use their beds and their ICUs. Uh, but the key thing for the people of New York City is we are there for you if you need us. You mentioned medical personnel. What about transporting patients, COVID patients, from hospitals to Javits? Is that likely possible? What's your sense of that? So uh, each city has their own processes to move patients around the city to balance the load. And New York, obviously, is a very large city, uh, has a pretty sophisticated way to do that. Northcom is working with the emergency medical services there to, uh, to make sure that if they need us, uh, they know how to get patients from wherever the patient is to where we are. Javits is the first, uh, and I think the you know the place that we opened up uh, first, and uh, we are ready to take patients if they need us to. All right, we'll go to the phone lines. Uh, try uh, Adris. Yeah, thanks. Um, two quick questions. Um, firstly, um, does Defense Secretary Esper still have confidence in uh, acting, saving, acting Navy Secretary Modi even after his comments on the ship? And secondly, just want to make sure. Um, you, you did say there has been no decision yet on starting treatment of COVID patients on the Comfort, correct? You want to take that one first? So uh, we are treating whatever patient is uh, sent to us by the New York EMS there. So it, the hospital ship is designed to take care of trauma patients, and that, that's what we originally offered was to serve as an overflow, if you will, for emergency rooms. But we're taking care of any patient that shows up. And as was mentioned previously, I think we've got 16 people in the ICU right now that we're taking care of. So with regard to your first question, I uh, had a couple meetings with the Secretary today. Uh, all of them were uh, COVID-related and uh, focused on the response efforts. Uh, we have not had a con an opportunity to, to talk about um, the, uh, the Navy Secretary's uh, remarks that were reported this morning. Um, I, I'll, for the time being, I'll refer you to, uh, to his, the Secretary's comments from yesterday. Um, and, but at this time, I don't have an update past that. So, Jennifer. So in light of the Prime Minister's uh, situation in Britain being in the intensive care unit, what is the plan for a designated survivor and any transition should the top leadership of this country fall victim to COVID-19? Who is the designated survivor after the president, vice president, and are they in any sort of a quarantine sequester right now? So I, th I think the, the Constitution and uh, the Succession Act lays out a pretty clear 
uh, guidance on, on who that, that time, that framework is and, and how it progresses. Um, uh, that's not something I've spent any time studying uh, with regard to this, um, but I, I'd refer you to the White House with regard to, to questions like that. Uh, DOD is, uh, is well positioned within, in terms of our leadership and ensuring that uh, our leadership is, uh, is uh, taking uh, effective precautionary measures uh, to limit the spread of COVID between uh, our senior officials uh, and ensuring that we have a, we have a leadership uh, framework in place. And did the secretary authorize Secretary Mosley to go out to the USS Roosevelt? Did he know he was going to speak to the crew? I haven't talked to him about that yet today, um, so I, I don't have an answer for you on that. Um, I, I look forward to, to speaking with him later about it, but I haven't had that chance today. We've been working on some other issues. Do you as a press secretary think it's appropriate for an acting Navy secretary to talk about the press the way he did on board this ship? So I, I don't want to get into to the comments that he made. Um, I think uh, there will be a time for us to have that conversation. Today, I want to focus on what we're doing with the, the general. Take us time here to talk about the medical efforts that we have uh, been taking uh, on with regard to COVID. Uh, I think uh, I, I've made my position with regard to working with the media uh, in this building, in this position, very clear. I think we've uh, worked very hard to be transparent, to be open, uh, to share information, and have a, a, a very productive relationship. So I think my position on the relationship between the department and the, and the media has been very very clear for, for some time, uh, and, and at this time I don't have any other comments on, on Secretary Modley's uh, conversations this morning. All right, so uh, we'll go back to the phone. Um, we'll go to uh, Louie from ABC. Hey, Jonathan. Um, a question for the doctor, please, if I could. Um, we, we've, we're hearing now about flattening, the possibility of flattening the curve in certain parts of the Northeast. Um, how do you flatten the curve in the military, um, given that you're spread out um, nationally um, does it depend on the local area, or is it just its, its own little micro area, and it's going to be up to the local commanders to figure out if they are approaching the curve or not? So thank you. Uh, I think it's no different in many respects in the military than it is in any community in the United States today. It starts with the individuals taking personal responsibility to minimize their contact and the risk that they, if they become infected, spread that infection. We've certainly implemented a number of measures, as we've discussed when I've been out here previously, going back all the way to January, in which we have tried to limit the risk of spread within military installations or within military communities. That's very much a partnership, since we're part of the broader community, and so each uh, base or uh, installation works with the community where they're located to understand how best to uh, limit that risk, not only to our population, but to the community population. Uh, and then at the enterprise level, uh, we've been working very hard on clear policies that uh, help to describe the best sciences as, as we understand it today, uh, derived largely from the Centers for Disease Control and the guidance that they put out for the nation. So it's a tiered approach, and it is going to look a little bit different in one community to the next based on what their resources are and their risks. Obviously, if you're in New York today, it's a very different place than if you're in a community that's not being hit as hard. Um, but I'll come back to something I've, I've mentioned each time uh, someone's asked me this question. It starts with each of us as individuals. Uh, we have got to share the responsibility for protecting not only our families, but protecting our communities. In the military, we do that every day. This is now part of what we as a nation have to do for each other. All right, I'm going to stick to the, the phone line here, and then we'll come back to the room. So, uh, Courtney? All right, we'll move on. Uh, Nancy? All right. We'll come back to the room then. Ryan? Yes, sir. Uh, one question on the Roosevelt and then another question on the personnel. <clears throat> on the Roosevelt, on Friday you said they hope to get 2,700 sailors off the ship by the end of the day. Uh, they are well short of that number as of today. Can you explain why they've, they've only met that they have, haven't have come close to meeting their own scheduled target? So I would I'd refer you to the Navy for the details on the process that they have in place. I have the updated numbers for today. So 61% of the crew have been tested. Uh, 173 positive, so we've seen the, the rate of increase decline uh, 
well over the last few days. Uh, as of today, they have 2,000 sailors that are off the ship. Uh, so they haven't hit 2,700. Um, they've made uh, great progress toward that. Fortunately, we're still at the point where there's zero, there's zero hospitalizations. Um, uh, my understanding on the, the process is that they are uh, within the town of, uh, or within the, 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 the territory of Guam, they're only allowing persons that have had uh, negative tests come back be allowed into those hotels. And so that's been the, the issue for a lot of it is getting the people tested, getting the results, identifying the people who are negative, and then moving them off into those locations. I'd refer you to the Navy for more detail. And that's, that's the depth of my understanding of it. Thank you. And then on the, on the additional military personnel, you mentioned the two field hospitals in Seattle and New Orleans. Will they be treating coronavirus patients at all and then coming online today? And then are you starting to stress out your medical military workforce? I mean, it's initially the military wasn't going to have a direct role in treating coronavirus patients. You're surging into New York City. Uh, probably other cities are going to be similarly hit. How close to, are you to kind of having to do involuntary call-ups of the IRR or something of that nature? So thanks. I think there were several questions in there. Uh, from the standpoint of stressing the medics who are involved in this, look, I think the entire country is stressed by this outbreak. And so is it stressful to be a medic taking care of an illness like this? Yes. Uh, is it what we signed up for when we became doctors or nurses or pharmacists? Yeah, we knew we were going to take care of sick people. Part of our commitment in the Department of Defense is to ensure that our medics have the protective equipment that they need so they can deliver the care that their patients need. Uh, that doesn't reduce the stress much, but that is part of that shared commitment going forward there. I think from the standpoint of are we stressing the force as a whole, um, I would describe it as we're balancing risk. Uh, we know that the right now the biggest threat is in New York City, and so we are accepting risk in other communities by moving medics who normally work in other communities up to New York to help out uh, those folks who are dealing with a really tough time right now. I anticipate as this continues to evolve that we're going to adjust where we are and who we're taking care of based on the demands of each community, what they need at that moment in time. Um, what, it, what I'm not able to do is say we're definitely going to do this on this date because it's a pretty fluid, a pretty dynamic situation right now. We work closely with FEMA and NORTHCOM continues to work with each of the local communities to understand what they need and how we can best support them and their citizens going forward. And we're adapting as we learn more about what's the most useful contribution that we can make. So well, you're not worried about running short of personnel in the near term? So I'm worried about a lot of things. Uh, I think all of us are, and I would be lying if I tried to minimize this right now. I, I think it is a balancing uh, equation that we're in right now of how do we balance risk to provide the greatest good to the greatest numbers. Am I worried that we're going to run out? Uh, that's the whole discussion we as a nation have been having is can we, uh, to go back to an earlier question, flatten the curve so we don't overwhelm the system? Part of what we're trying to do as military medics is to help communities so that they have enough capacity that if someone needs care, they can get it until we can get beyond that peak in that particular community. I think so far we've been able to do that. Uh, you know, my hat's off to the communities in Washington State. I think they've done an excellent job there. And we're working with many other communities going forward to make sure that we can fall in on that local infrastructure, help them get through the worst period, and then go to wherever else they need us next. Thank you. All right, so uh, we've got a we've got a uh, an email question from the AP, so they weren't able to jump on. So um, this is for you, Doc. Okay. Uh, can you bring us up to date on the hospital ships on both coasts and whether they will accept a COVID patient, or whether they have gotten any infected patients on board deliberately or accidentally due to the new ambulance drop-off program? So both hospital ships are accepting patients, and uh, you know our commitment has been that if a patient comes to us, we would take care of them. Uh, have we had patients who ultimately were determined to have coronavirus on the hospital ships? Yes. Uh, and we're taking care of them just like we're taking care of all the other patients going forward. So, uh, you know, part of what we're there for as military medics is to help those communities and to help the patients that are brought to us for care. And that's exactly what we're doing. Mike? What are the numbers on the Mercy? Now you said the numbers for the comfort. What about the numbers on the Mercy? And for the ones when you do have a coronavirus patient uh, that discovers while they're a patient, do you 
Are you able to put them in some kind of uh, quarantine room there? Or have you already have you set up places for that? So yes, we have the ability on the hospital ships to isolate. Yes, to isolate uh, a, a small number of patients. Again, that's not what the ships are primarily designed for. But yes, we have the ability to do that. Um, so. You know, the challenge with coronavirus, like many infectious diseases, is someone comes in and they're sick, and you don't know exactly what the cause of their illness is. So the first charge is do no harm, and that's exactly the approach that we've taken. How do we take care of the person who's in front of us and deliver the care that they need? Part of that early assessment is doing the testing for a whole lot of things, whether it's flu or a chest x-ray to see if they have pneumonia or a test to see if they have coronavirus. If we determine that they have coronavirus, then we will isolate them. And right now, in many cases, if we think they might, we're isolating them proactively until we get the test results back going forward. So yes, we have the ability to isolate uh, a small number on each of the ships, and we are using that as we go forward. How many numbers on the on the Mercy? Do you have that? I'm looking for that right now, and among the many numbers that I had, it's it's less than 50, but I'll get you the exact number uh, by the end of the day today. Okay, uh, we'll go back to the phone lines. Uh, TM. Hey, TM here. Thanks. Uh, I mean, I understand you don't want to talk about the Roosevelt, but this is kind of a crisis of the Pentagon's own making. And just a question on that. So if Secretary Esper still has trust and confidence in the acting Secretary of the Navy, what do you do if the Navy doesn't have trust and confidence in their acting Secretary? So, like I said, it's not that uh, that I don't want to. I said I'm not going to. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, I'm going to refer you to the Secretary's comments from yesterday. I haven't spoken with him about this today, so I don't have any additional um, input to give you on that uh, that topic. So. Any follow-ups or any additional questions on other topics, TM? All set, thanks. Okay. Uh, David Martin, CBS. Could you uh, finish on the question of uh, whether or not the field hospitals in Seattle and New Orleans will uh, accept uh, COVID patients or if they're going to operate under the same principle as the, uh, the hospital ships? Yes, yeah, so thank you. And uh, look, we'll we'll take care of whatever patients the local communities send to us in both of those locations. Uh, Northcom has been working with uh, with the local communities and with FEMA. The secretary uh, did authorize uh, the facilities to provide the support that was needed there. So that's that's why we're there. Thank you. So the CDC has predicted it could be up to 50% of Americans, right, who end up uh, contracting COVID-19. What are your guys' projections in terms of troops, given that the infection rate's already a little bit lower, the hospitalization and death rates are also lower? Yeah, so I, I think you've hit on one of the real challenges of this outbreak right now is that uh, the projections are proving not to be all that accurate. And so, as I said a few minutes ago, what we're focusing on is how do we minimize risk today and how do we make sure we're taking care of those who are sick today and, most importantly, minimize more people becoming sick. Um, you know, we'll know in a few months what the real transmission rate is and what the real infection rate is. But right now, what we're focused on is taking care of those who are sick and minimizing the number of additional folks who become sick. Okay. Um, we'll go with phones. Uh, Jack, foreign policy. Hey, nothing at this time. Okay. Uh, Sylvie, AFP. Yes, hello. Do you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I wanted to know how, um, how far you are right now in uh, the development of a vaccine. And also, we heard this morning that um, the, you, the, the military don't have don't have enough uh, antibody tests, so they cannot know if uh, somebody is, has already, uh, you know, recovered uh, from COVID-19 and could be uh, healthy and, and ready to go anywhere. So I wanted to know where you are in terms of uh, vaccine, antibody test, and antiviral treatments. Yes, yeah, so thank you, ma'am, uh, for those questions. Uh, as far as vaccines are concerned, we're pursuing a number of different vaccine candidates. I think there's five that the Department of Defense is directly involved in, as well as supporting a number of projects through our interagency collaboration. So we have trials that we're either directly supporting or research that we're doing directly, as well as uh, supporting efforts by other federal agencies. 
And those are moving forward. Uh, as uh, Mr. Hoffman mentioned in his opening comments, uh, we have uh, some animal safety trials beginning today at one of our labs. I think it's important for everyone to keep in mind that this is a, a process that is going as quickly as it can, and we're balancing again that risk of how do we make sure any vaccine candidates are safe, try them first on animals, then we try them on a small group of people. Then once we know that they're safe, we expand the testing of the vaccine candidates to try them on a larger group to see how effective they are. And only when we know that they are both safe and effective will we be able to offer them more widely to larger numbers. So we're making progress on those. Uh, I don't want to create a false uh, expectation, though, that the, a vaccine is right around the corner. As has been briefed by the, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks and many others, uh, we are still months away, not weeks away from a vaccine uh, as we step through doing this as safely and effectively as possible. As far as medical countermeasures are concerned, we're also involved in a number of trials both within our military facilities and in support of our interagency and academic partners looking at different drugs to see if they might have some impact on reducing either the severity of an infection or the length of an infection. I think we'll get results back, not I think, we will get results back on those faster than we will on the vaccine trials. Okay, uh, and do, yeah, and um, do, you do you distribute uh, chloroquine to military personnel? Uh, Ma'am, could you repeat the question, please? Do, do you um, uh, uh, give, um, you know, this uh, um, uh, very much discussed um, uh, medication, chloroquine, to, uh, to military personnel? So that is one of the drugs that's being tested. Uh, there is a trial ongoing right now with chloroquine, uh, but no, we are not widely distributing it to everybody in the military. And then you had also asked about antibody testing or serology testing. Yes. Uh, so I, I think the best organization to answer that right now is the Centers for Disease Control. They've just brought online a large capacity for that type of serology testing. In addition, we are doing research on that in some of our labs to look at what uh, will be the most meaningful serology test to help us identify either who has uh, previously been infected or who's fully recovered. But right now, the, the best gauge that we have for who's recovered is the absence of symptoms or two negative polymerase chain reaction tests. So we're following the CDC guidelines to document who is fully recovered from an infection. Okay. Jennifer, you have all. Dr. Friedrichs, can I just follow up? Do you have any new information or any suspicion that this uh, COVID-19 may have been the result of a bioweapon? I know there initially was some talk of that. It was laughed at, but then it keeps coming back around in some reports. Is there anything to that? No. All right. So and, go back and, to the and if I could just be clear, there is nothing to that. I, I think there's someone asked me if I was worried. Um, that is not something that I'm worried about. I think, you know, right now what we're concerned about is how do we treat people who are sick? How do we prevent people from getting sick? But uh, no, I'm not worried about this as a bioweapon. Okay. So uh, let's uh, go back to the phones. Uh, Jeff from Task and Purpose. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, you're also a, an attorney and a lawyer. Is it possible that Secretary Mobley may have committed unlawful command influence with his comments aboard the Theodore Roosevelt? We've had this conversation before. I am not allowed to practice law from the podium. Um, I've been given very strict guidance from our general counsel, so I will refrain from, from answering that question. Um, so uh, one last time, uh, anybody from NBC? I saw Courtney. Um, most... Can I ask a follow-up? Uh, sure, Jeff. Uh, as long as it's not a legal the, question. No, you said the Secretary is allowing the Air Force and the Navy to, or all the services, to pause basic training for two weeks. Can you say whether the Army and the Navy had initially proposed such a pause and that they were ultimately overruled? Um, I don't, I don't quite follow you on that because I know the Navy, the Army has announced a pause, so I don't, I don't quite follow that. Can you... Can you repeat that? There was a Washington Post story about a month ago uh, that said the Army had proposed putting a 30-day stay on basic training, and the uh, Navy had proposed kind of a middle route, but ultimately the Pentagon decided it was better to keep shipping 
recruits to basic training and boot camp. Since then, of course, the Army has announced its pause. But I'm talking uh, about a month ago. Was uh, Did the Defense Department decide over uh, what the services had suggested to continue suggesting recruits to, uh, shipping recruits to basic training? No, I think, I think what you just described is an interagency process. So I think what you described is a, is a conversation between uh, the different services, uh, the Army, the, the Air Force, and the Navy, uh, about the process that they wanted to pursue and they thought was the best with regard to training. And so e- each service has very different uh, demands. I mean, the Army has a... Uh, four major training bases around the country. The the Marine Corps does two, one on each coast. The Air Force does Blackland is their major one. The Navy has a couple. So they have some different processes. So uh, I think what you saw over the last uh, uh, month, I'm not exactly sure when that story you're, you're quoting happened, but uh, where each of the services came together with the secretary, uh, sat down with the chairman, uh, received his best advice, received advice from the service secretaries, uh, and the result of that conversation was uh, the secretary giving direction to the services uh, and authorizing a, a, a two-week pause at this point um, to, uh, to adjust the training. And so what the expectation is is the, some additional processes have already been put in place. I think you've seen the Marine Corps has begun alternating training classes, uh, one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast, in an effort to spread it out. The Air Force has adopted measures to, uh, to spread out the number of, uh, of trainees coming through. Um, but they've, uh, they've taken different approaches. Uh, but the guidance was to get on some sort of a, a minimum standard footing. Uh, and then what we'll do is over the coming weeks and months, we'll look, look at that and uh, decide whether any adjustments need to be made. But, but what you've described sounds to me like the interagency process that, that t- normally takes place at the department uh, between the services and uh, with the chairman providing advice to the secretary. Um, Moshe? So, yeah, the only question that I had was, uh, so yesterday the White House basically said that this week was going to be, you know, we'd see a lot of peaks. It was kind of a, a banner week. Uh, do we... I think that the for the military that those same models are going to follow for military personnel. Is there any indication uh, or any uh, uh, any further measure, measures that are going to be put in place to kind of help mitigate that? Yeah. So uh, thank you. I, you know, we look at this every day, uh, and I have uh, I've been part of those discussions with senior leaders looking at risk and what are what our data is telling us about what's happening in particular locations around the world or in specific locations. And uh, and then we make decisions about what the best actions are to mitigate risk. Uh, I don't think that the military population is going to be hugely different than an age-matched population. Um, We're going to appear different because we have a lot more young people, uh, and so that may create the perception that somehow we're having different outcomes than everybody else. But uh, from from a medical standpoint, we're implementing the same measures that uh, the president and others have encouraged the entire country to implement. And uh, they are proving to be effective. You've uh, seen the reports coming out of Korea. Good social distancing and uh, really aggressive measures to limit the spread have uh, had a very positive effect on limiting the number of people who became infected on any of our bases in Korea, even though they were in areas with large community outbreaks. Uh, I think that's the best case scenario, that we do our part to implement those prudent measures and we reduce the number of infections within our community so that we don't uh, create a further burden either on our system or on the community system. And if I could, just to go back to the question that was answered, I knew I had it some here in my book. There were 22 patients treated total so far on the Mercy, so. uh, Uh, So the last question, we'll go to Ellen from Synopsis. Hi. um, Well, hang on. Sorry, I have to figure out how the phone works. Um, Good afternoon, sir. Could you give me a breakout of where the medical personnel are coming from, from which service, and how many are active duty and how many are reserve? So... uh, where they're coming from, particularly for the volunteer reservist, is really all over the country. I mean, these are men and women who stepped up when we asked for volunteers and said that they were willing to leave their communities. So I don't have a breakdown for all uh, 700 of them as far as where they're coming from. Uh, we have uh, 125 Air Force reservists who are going to New York. We have 200 Navy reservists 
who are also going to New York. Uh, and then we've got a variety of other teams, uh, reserve teams that are going to New Jersey and to Connecticut. Uh, I think the, the key thing on this, and I, I started with this and I'll end with this. Um, you know, the American people are recognizing this is not business as usual, and people are stepping up to help each other out. And that is exactly what you're seeing with these reservists. And my hat's off to them because they have chosen to leave their homes and come forward when we ask for volunteers to help out. So where they come from? They come from America. That, this is what we're doing. We're each stepping forward to help each other out. Thank you. Can you give me a breakout by service? Sure, I'll be happy to provide that separately. We can give that breakout separately. Okay. All right, everybody, thank you very much. And um, uh, I, I appreciate everybody's frustration with my inability to provide comment right now on um, the TR. Um, but I will, uh, I'll be working on that and try to get back to you guys um, after I talk with the Secretary uh, today. It's been a busy day focused on COVID and the, the coming peak in New York and what we're trying to do. So I uh, appreciate your patience. Thank you, guys.